guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today, you guessed it, John Campion. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. And hot damn, we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also here, John Schnepp. I haven't heard that in a while. <laughs> Guess who's back? It's John Campia. Happy to be here. All you Salt Lake uh, City sweaties. It yeah. was fun to hang out in Utah this weekend. I was just talking about drinking a lot of those Wasatch Devastators. What's up? He was also talking a lot about polygamy. Oh, when I came know, the back. polygamy, the polygamy beer. <laughs> Let us just get that straight. <laughs> also, here's Mark Ellis. Great to have Mr. Campia back. I'm sure everybody in Salt Lake City, as well as around the world, can agree Taco Bell needs to start making chimichangas. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Is that your Obama impression? That was, no, that Obama was Bob mixed Dole. That with Clinton. Like Clinton. <laughs> a little bit of Dole yeah. thrown okay. in there. If you just keep the chimichangas at Taco Bell, we can all everybody have fun. Everybody be happy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Enough about Jimmy Chonga. That's all right. Labor Day has typically marked the end of summer vacation, and that means it's also the end of the summer blockbuster season, which began back in May. Summer 2016 was filled with unwanted sequels and box office flops, but it wasn't all doom and gloom. There were some solid summer flicks this year that will last long after the leaves have started to fall. With $3.54 in ticket sales, it's time we look at the hits, the failures, and the surprises people were talking about. John Schneider and Mark, what were your top three favorite movies and your worst three summer movies of 2016? John, let's start with you. All right, I'll lead off here. Let's start off with the bad side of things here. I'd like to, I want to end it on a good note. Okay. Yeah. On the bad side of things, uh, my number three worst movie of the summer, uh, also maybe my most disappointing because, damn it, I drank the Kool-Aid and I actually thought this was going to be a good movie, uh, Independence Day Resurgence. Yep. I really thought the movie was going to be good. I re right, We all saw it together. Yeah, right did. from the moment that we mm. walked in the theater that night, into that <clears throat> empty movie theater that night, right. I my hopes were this high. I was buzzing. I was excited. Anyway, mm. my my and then my two other worst films of the summer are going to surprise some people because I thought both of these films had Oscar potential. And one for sure was Free State of Jones. Mm. I thought Free State of Jones was going to be a lock for an Oscar consideration, both for McConaughey as an actor, your director, your film. Um, and there is only one other movie I probably disliked more this summer than that. And that other movie was another potential Oscar one that should have, when you looked at the director, the theme, the stars, Light Between Oceans. Mm. To me, it was the worst movie of the summer. Mm. Um, I'll juxtapose that against one of my better movies this summer. But those are my three. Independence Day Resurgence, uh, Free State of Jones, and Light Between Oceans. Mark, what would you say comes in at the bottom of the barrel? Well, I would echo your sentiments on one of those films, John, and I think we all know what we're talking about. <laughs> Dennis Zhang actually celebrated his 40th birthday in the theater <laughs> with us right. during Independence Day Resurgence. He turned 40, and I felt like I turned 90. That <laughs> movie is the worst film of the entire Entire summer it was so bad that even the other two on my list I can't even equate mm. with the badness that was represented <laughs> by Independence Day 4 part 2 resurgence the movie sucks I want to stop thinking about it the one that disappointed me the most it's not necessarily a terrible movie but the shallows is something I was so looking oh, forward wow. to I wanted to see Blake Lively versus a shark and I wanted it to be fun and it started out that way it's not a terrible movie but I can't think of another film that let me down more than the shallows but it wasn't as bad as the mechanic resurrection Ooh. which i also got to see so i'd probably have id4 uh to far and away number one mechanic resurrection at two which like if you can't even be a bad cable action movie there's a fault there there's something bad's going on and then the shallows i'll say is probably my number three right now i might watch it again and have more love for the film i like the way it started out it just didn't live up to the promise of blake lively and a shark. <laughs> Snap the so, bottom of the barrel. Bottom of the barrel. There's one that's like in between a uh, really good, really bad, and that's Warcraft. So I'm still mm. like, I liked parts of it. I found other parts of it really horrible. So it's not in my worst, but I wanted to mention it is like it's in the middle somewhere. I'm gonna have to watch it again. But for me, bottom of the barrel. Alice Through the Looking Glass. I mm. could not wait to get out of that theater and strangle the white rabbit for forcing <laughs> me to go through time in this like incredibly boring, hollow excuse for CGI graphics. I'm glad everybody got paid. That's how I felt like all these people made a lot of money. That's good. Unfortunately, they wasted their time in this film. It's horrible. Um, Independence Day, Regurgence. I was <laughs> ranking on this movie from the 
first one when it was called ID Forever. Yeah. I remember this is a horrible <laughs> thing, and I had to wait for two years while destroying it every time we talked about it yep. until I finally saw the stinker, and it was worse than I possibly could imagine. <laughs> it had a, a Siri robot. Remember, we are. I am part of the other universe, so some <laughs> orb. It's so horrible. It's not even worth talking about. And then another one for myself. I know you guys liked it. Secret Life of Pets. I thought was horrible. It wow, was, I actually I, really liked that I one. I hated that film. Why? Because I felt I was uh, I was mismarketed something. I was like the trailers are like you're gonna go in you know behind the door when you leave you'll see what your pets do and it's like my pets don't drive cars and hang out <laughs> in the sewers <laughs> that you cause, know of yeah, that I know that of that you know that of. cause a lot of damage driving cars. I just once that started I was like I want to get out of this movie I don't like it so for me it sucked. That's what, that, those are the three that were the worst. You know, right. I'm, I'm going to take out the shark movie. I'm going to put in Ben Hur because I was thinking about it. And I was like, you know what? What would I rather watch again? And what movie needed to be made? Do we really need a remake for Ben Hur? No, but we did need at least to try seeing Blake Lively go against a shark. So I'll take out the shallows. Well, let's stick with you too. Then let's go to the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. Because you know, a lot of people were talking about how like summer 2016 was a big letdown, but there were actually when you step back and look at it. There were a lot of really good movies this summer. So what comes in at the top for you, Mark? And a lot of those were independent films that weren't like the huge blockbusters that we were looking forward to for years and years on end. And mm -hmm. two of those for me were Kubo and the Two Strings and Hell or High Water. They came out late in the year. Mm -hmm. It was like August made a late push. It was like Frank Reich in that playoff game in 93. <laughs> I don't know if we ended up winning this summer Nice or Bill's not. reference. Thank I like you that. very much. I'm here for you, Four Falls of Buffalo. <laughs> I just don't think that we got quite enough at the end of the summer to make up for all the disappointing blockbusters. Mm. There's another indie film that not a lot of people saw. That actually is my number one movie this summer, and it was called, let me get the name right, Captain America Civil War. <laughs> if you haven't seen it yet, get it on your radar. It's really good. I heard about it. It's got a bunch of other characters in it, too, It's right? really, it's a small story. Yeah. It's a small, not a lot of effects in it, right. but uh, there's a little tiny ant guy. Schnapp, mm -hmm. what about you? What would come out in the top of your list? Uh, I would echo Mark's sentiment. Civil War, for me, as far as entertainment, we're talking about big budget films, so for myself, Civil War is at the top. I, I absolutely love that film. I had a grin from from ear to ear through the entire film, especially as a comic book fan, seeing that airport sequence done so well, all those characters, it was a lot of fun. Star Trek Beyond to me as well. Love What that an movie. incredible film. If you haven't seen it, go out and see it now. It's still in a few theaters. What an incredible film. I mean, I don't know why I waited a couple weeks to see it, but when I finally saw it, I could not believe how much fun I had in that theater. I was like, I think it's the best of the new Star Treks. Mm -hmm. uh, from this alternate pocket universe of JJ. So that, and then definitely Kubo, as far as for an animated, that's the polar opposite. Uh, you know, the Secret Life of Pets is in the, my bottom. Kubo is the top. It's my favorite animated film of the year. If you definitely, Kubo and the Two Strings, go see it. And then for horror films, Don't Breathe and Lights Out, for me, were like two really great horror films that I absolutely love from beginning to end for different reasons. Obviously, one's about a creepy supernatural witch. We saw that one together, <laughs> freaking me out the entire time. And then the other one's about a creepy, weird blind dude freaking me out the entire time. What a great, a great year for horror for sure. I mean, those are the two. Those are the ones that I would list off. Yeah, there are a couple of really good honorable mentions for me. Kubo and the Two Strings mm -hmm. was remarkable. Conjuring Two, mm. Lights Out, totally. Don't Breathe, uh, Star Trek Beyond. I mean, there's some. Uh, also, Zootopia ended up surprising me because I didn't think that movie was going to be any good, and it was quite good. For me, my my three favorite right now is number one, Captain America: Civil War. Mm -hmm. It 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 might still be my number one or two spot overall for the entire year, not just the summer. That movie was just incredible. Um, and then the next two, in no particular order, it, rounding up my top three, one is Hell or High Water. Mm -hmm. I mean, we I started hearing people talking about this movie, but quite often when you hear people buzzing so high, you walk in and say, yeah, "Okay, I see that it was good." This movie floored me, mm -hmm. you know? And it's a very slow movie, but let's compare it to like Light Between Oceans, the one that's in my bottom of three, right? <laughs> mm. Both are slow movies, right? But in Hell or High Water, every single scene had absolute significance. And as it's very slowly moving around, everything that happens, happens for a reason and moves the story along. Whereas in Light Between Oceans, there are like entire segments that didn't need to be there. Let Nothing me read happens. you this letter. Wait, <laughs> yes. I've got a letter for you. I can't, no more letters. The whole movie is letters. 
<laughs> now, if Jeff Bridges as the crusty sheriff was in that boat instead of a baby, <laughs> yeah. that's a good that's a movie I want to see. But then you'd have yeah. to listen to Jeff Bridges mush mouth really for the whole time. I would like kill myself. But I love I agree with you. Hell or high water. I just saw it. I agree with you. It's and fantastic. then my number three in the best movies of the year right now is is Nice Guys. I I mm. was floored by when I saw the trailer. It lived up to the hype for me. So uh, yeah. Now the important thing here really is not what do these three idiots up here think about the best and the worst of summer 2016. What did you think about the best and the worst of the summer 2016? Jump into our comments section and let us know your thoughts and make sure you uh, leave your thoughts on that. All right, what's next? After the long holiday weekend, it's time for the box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Don't Breathe dominated the four-day Labor Day weekend, taking in $19.6 million for the number one spot, bringing its domestic total to $55 million. Suicide Squad took in $12.8 million for the number two spot, crossing $300 million domestic in the process. Pete's Dragon came in at number three with $8.6 million, with Kubo and the Two Strings right on its heels at $8.5 million for the number four spot. And at number five is Sausage Party taking in at 6.5 million over four days for a total of 89.6 domestic. John, what do you think about the Labor Day box office totals? A couple things that really stand out. Number one, totally thrilled for Don't Breathe as doing well. Mm. Only a 40% drop wow. in its box office. Super well done going from week one into week two. I mean, this summer especially, we've been used to seeing 60, 65, 70% drops. Don't Breathe, the word of mouth has gotten out there. This is a movie to see. But really stood out to me, look, I was not expecting this movie to come in number one one but at 2000 screens the new little horror film Morgan mm. in a year comes in at number 17 Ooh. makes only 1.9 million dollars opening on, weekend yep on wow. 2000 screens especially in a year that has been so great for these little kind of horror thriller films uh, just absolutely bottoms out so that's unfortunate to see but for me the big story is don't breathe hanging in there so strong mark what stands out to you well i hope jim and the holograms need a bass player because morgan <laughs> is ready to take on that mantle i didn't get a chance to see morgan yet and i was really bummed like i know uh christian did the review for schmoes and perry liked it more than he did but i still felt like it was like a movie worth checking out so it's shocking to see it made that little on that many screens the light between oceans also opening did not crack the top five something else that stands out to me is a movie that we didn't talk about our biggest surprises of the summer but one of those for me was definitely bad moms that movie is hilarious yeah. it's a great theater experience you will be laughing the entire time and it almost made the top five again this week it was number six just below sausage and Party. it has now crossed a hundred million domestic it's a certifiable hit it's a certified as hit is now. something yeah. like don't breathe because don't breathe costs less than 10 million dollars to make and it's already over 50 that is awesome and i would like to see more from the don't breathe universe or maybe something else along a similar storyline done by the same people because there's a lot of town involved in that movie schnepp what stands out to you uh definitely don't breathe i don't want the sequel to be like don't breathe again or like <laughs> i still know you're breathing i you know some weird <laughs> jack Reed yeah. You're never breathing. Yeah. Continue not breathing or something <laughs> stupid. But I definitely, what a fantastic film. And I'm so happy that word of mouth is keeping it alive because coming out of that that screening that I went to, I couldn't stop talking about it. I was talking to my Lyft driver. I was just like, you got to see this movie. He's like, I'm totally going to see this movie. So I think word of mouth is mm -hmm. exciting. And that's a, definitely, uh, we see with a 40% non-drop, really, literally, it's not a drop. It's just, it's just keep staying level. It's great to see it as number one again. That to me, and to see Suicide Squad break, it's it, it broke over a Man of Steel this week. It finally, it, <clears throat> it actually made more than Man of Steel. So I know there's a ton of mixed reviews for the film, but I'm glad to see that people are going and seeing the film. And they want to see DC comic movies done right. So hopefully the course correction that Jeff Johns is involved in is going to make the Justice League work a little bit better as far as for the DC universe. So I'm glad to see that Suicide Squad still. Yeah, Suicide there. Squad now creeping up at $675 million worldwide. Mm -hmm. Guess what? It made. Don't believe the, the reports you're hearing. This movie has made money for Warner Brothers oh, yeah. at $675 million. All right, what's next? Some new set photos have been snapped from the set of Spider-Man Homecoming, seemingly revealing the villain Shocker. At this point, little is known about who took the photos, though the images have popped up on multiple Twitter accounts showing an unidentified actor in costume. However, no confirmation from Marvel or Sony in regards to who might be under the costume. Schnepp, what do you think about the new image of Shocker from Spider-Man Homecoming? I think uh, that that head is that head shape looks like Bokeem Woodbine <laughs> I don't know I was just trying to look at the shocker and then look at Bokeem's bald head and I was like that Bokeem Woodbine inside that mask I'm excited I think it looks cool it definitely I love the way Marvel is able to take the aesthetics 
of the old school look of a character and just bring it into the now and it still feels like the shocker he's still got that stupid like patchwork pattern if you look at the original 60s uh john remita senior artwork of the shocker character this just looks like the shocker just updated to 2016. i don't think he's going to be a big role in spider-man homecoming hopefully it's sort of like a you're because we already know spider-man is fighting crime so maybe this is just the opening sequence with Sp spider-man fighting a bad guy and it could be the shocker I buy these photos. I love the way it looks, so that's for me. Let me ask you this. There are some people who hear, maybe who aren't really well-versed in Spider-Man lore, and they hear, Shocker, is this just another Electro? <clears throat> Explain Shocker a little bit to, to uh, people who may not know. He's just like kind of a common hood who gets these like cool shocking devices, and literally he was a one-off. Like If you read the, the issue that he's in, he's like, and here comes the Shocker. Like <laughs> Just read it like Stan Lee is reading. It's like a crazy character who's robbing banks, and he's got an electrical shocking device. Spider-Man fights him he's you know takes him out pretty quickly and he just kept kept coming back you know he's been in a bunch of uh, issues but he's not like the rogues gallery up there with green green goblin is the shocker he's not really that important of a character so that's why he's a c-lister which i think is cool I he's think like the bring... plus one when you yeah. go to like the villain ball <laughs> totally <laughs> Like, no, ball. it should be under a shocker. Yeah. I'm so we're not seeing yeah. your name. No, you're not on the list, sir. I, no, 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 I swear yeah, to God. Got the plus one for Mysterio. Yeah. Is Mysterio on yeah. the list? And he's, a, he's not even the plus one. He's like, he has to lie about being a plus one. So. You're the waiter. Okay, Mark, your thoughts on these pictures of the shocker? Uh, look, it's 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 either really great cosplay or it's a cool looking villain for somebody. By the way, every time we're, we say the word the shocker up here, I'm catching Ashley Mova grinning. I just can't hear this <laughs> word know. and this picture. Every time you're like, what do you think of the shocker image? Like, explain Shocker to us, Shep. Let us know about the Shocker. I'm just like, oh, my God. And you I know Ashley has the dirtiest mind on this panel, no, so you know what she's doing. Everyone's going to. thinking it. I'm just saying. She's, say, she's the one saying it. Mark, I'm sorry for interrupting. Please continue. Yeah, John. So anyway, the Shocker, if you look here, you'll see the Shocker. And what that is is that, you know the reason why I buy these, though, is because it, it's because the one in the middle, there's like a hand with a pencil. Like, anybody can get together a neat-looking Shocker costume. The fact that there's a hand with a pencil pencil guiding the shocker <laughs> means that he's on some sort of set it's not just some rogue cosplay guy there's something official going on here so i do think these are actually from the set i think the shocker is going to be a great setup villain for spidey to prove his metal all right, folks, we reached that part of the show enough for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items from the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? According to a report from Radar Online, Shocker. Sony Pictures is offering James Bond star Daniel Craig $150 million to reprise his role as 007 for two more franchise films. Radar sources say the studio is desperate to secure the actor's services while they phase in a younger, long-term successor. Up to seven different stars have been rumored to be in the running for the iconic role, including Idris Elba, Michael Fassbender, and Tom Hiddleston. There's no confirmation from Sony as of the legi legitimacy of this report so this should be classified as a rumor for now mark do you buy or sell a 150 million payday for dale and craig to reprise his role as james bond well ashley i would be shocked if they paid him 150 million dollars for more movies as james bond for two reasons one nobody is worth that money like you tom cruise in mission impossible going forward is not worth that kind of cheddar and especially a guy who clearly didn't seem to be that invested in the last movie specter which the movie was a little boring overall but daniel Craig didn't add what I thought he would as James Bond like he had done in Skyfall, Quantum of Solace, and Casino Royale. So when you look at any of those other names that Ashley just rattled off, whether it's Tom Hiddleston or it's Idris Elba, Michael Fassbender, whoever the hell you want to get as James Bond is going to be a lot cheaper and invigorate the franchise. You need to inject freshness into this thing. After seeing Spectre, that's what the franchise needs going forward. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the right move to not pay Daniel Craig anything, much less $150 million. Right. It's a huge sell for me. Yeah, I've got to sell this. I have to. I, and I love Daniel Craig as James Bond. I think he is magnificent. But what you said, Mark, is exactly right. No actor is worth that much. Some spinal surgeon who takes a bus wreck with 50 kids in it and makes sure they can all walk again, give that dude $150 <laughs> million. Right. I just don't see any actor being worth this much. Look, you can't tell me if we put Tom Hiddleston in as the new James Bond, this movie will make $75 million less than if we get... Daniel Craig back. No, it won't.
don't. Daniel Craig, I believe, is the best James Bond we've ever had. I, I've said this before. I believe he is like the perfect mix between your Sean Connery Bond and your Roger Moore Bond. He's like the best of both of those guys kind of merged into this one pseudo super Bond at the same time. But $150 million for two films, $75 million bucks per picture, absolutely no way. And by the way, I also sell that this report is true. I, I just can't see Sony believing that they had to pay that much money or, or feel that they're so desperate that no one else can carry this right now. No, you're right. Michael Fassbender would make a great James Bond. Tom Hiddleston would make a great James Bond. Idris Elba would make a great James Bond. There's a lot of guys out there that can do it for a much lower paycheck. So for me, it's got to be a sell all the way around. Schnepp? Yeah, I agree. I mean, this was a shocker to hear about <laughs> $150 million. It's basically $150 million was they were going to spend that on Gambit and that fell apart. That was the entire budget for a stupid film. They're going to pay one guy this? I don't believe this I sell it I don't believe this is true and if it is true it's sad and desperate because Daniel Craig himself is sick of being Bond I can't stand hearing actors complain about a role that's helped make their career and yet you know no, no, not help make his, I know I'm being nice about career. it it's made his career yeah. but I'm just saying it's like how negative he's been in the reports for the last two James Bonds I'm sick of this role I don't want to do it anymore and then this last one Spectre which I thought was horrible I love Skyfall and I hated Spectre I thought Walt, Christoph Waltz as a as a villain. The uh, what's his name? I can't, I can't even remember his name right now. It was so unmemorable. But a very uh, Blofeld. Or, I'm pretty well, sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, anyway, sure. it's like they ruined that. They should have been great. And instead, they had like Xerox Kinko things at the end. They were like, "Look at all the way I've set you up. I've been the spy, the control master." It was like, "Get out, get me out of the theater. I hate this." So I don't want to see. I don't want to see Daniel Craig as James Bond anymore, especially because he doesn't want to be James Bond anymore. I thought he was great in the other films. I think it's time to get a new James Bond, and any amount of money is not going to save this property. You need a new James Bond. That's what I was going to ask you guys, is do you think that Daniel Craig deserves one more shot as James Bond for like that redemption role? Because remember, Quantum of Solace wasn't as loved as Casino Royale. Exactly. So it was. you started out on a high, you went to a valley, you went to another peak with Skyfall, yep. went down with Spectre. Do you guys want to see Daniel Craig get that last chance to ride off into the sunset, or would you guys rather just have a new James Bond in the next film? I, I would love to see Daniel Craig return. I really would. Because mm -hmm. like you said, before there was Skyfall, which is a lot of people's favorite film of this franchise. Mm -hmm. There was a not so well received right. one. So he did a great one, not so well received. Great one, and now not so well received. I would love to see him come back and do another one. Now this opens up another question too. Some people are suggesting that, look, the Sony executives love Daniel Craig, and mm -hmm. Daniel Craig knows it. A lot of people are now suggesting that, hey, all this talk about Craig not wanting to come back as Bond, was all just like a uh, uh, strategy. It was all just strategy on his part to try to get the bigger payday. I don't know. At this point, let's say money wasn't the issue. Mm -hmm. Do you just in general want to see him come back or would you, do you just think now it's time to move on? I think him? it's time to move on. I'm totally cool with having two really good James Bond movies that he was in and two not so good James <laughs> Bond movies that he's in, he was in. I'm totally good to see a brand new James Bond. I love Casino Royale. I love Skyfall. The other two I didn't. And yet, I mean, if, whether he's playing these games as far as to get a bigger paycheck, I just didn't think Spectre worked. Sam Mendes did a great job with Skyfall. The second one, Spectre, not so great. And so I'd like to see a brand new team on James Bond. All right, what's next? According to ComingSoon.net, Sony Pictures will need more time to get their Uncharted movie ready to go. The site reports that the film was just removed from the studio's release calendar, which was previously scheduled to hit theaters on June 30th, 2017. Joe Carnahan is the current screenwriter tasked with bringing the story to the screen. No other details have been offered at this time. John Byers sells Sony dropping the release date for Uncharted. I completely buy it because when you look at that release, not because I don't want to see this movie, I do, but but when you look at the release schedule and understanding Carnahan has just come on to basically, let's face it, this is a page one rewrite. Mm -hmm. They're not saying that, but that's what it is. They know they've got a potentially really big hit on their hands. They know they don't want to rush it too much. You know me, look, you got two years, that's not rushing. I think people use the word rushing far too often. But if you're doing a page one rewrite and you got a guy with Carnahan's talent on board right now, that is too soon of a release date. Give him some time to bring this thing to life. Totally buy this move, Mark. I would buy it as well, yeah, because you want to do it right. Because Uncharted is not just going to be a one-off movie where, hey, we really like that yeah. movie. Let's go home. No, this thing is going to be a franchise. This is loaded with sequel opportunity, as we're going to see from the video games as well. And maybe they're feeling a little bit too much pressure to be that first movie mm, that yeah. finally turns the tide and makes video game films acceptable and good and Oscar contenders and huge box office and all that stuff. Warcraft wanted to 
to be it. I don't think Warcraft made it. I think Assassin's Creed will. I have a lot of hope for that. But maybe they just want to take their time and see what the way the tides are when Uncharted finally comes out. It is definitely the right move to take your time with this. I do not want to see a rushed Uncharted. Schnapp, buy or sell this bumping Uncharted at the moment. Yeah, no, I, I buy I buy them unscheduling Uncharted. Right. I think it's, like, <laughs> it's a smart move because you're right. A page one rewrite. Say it takes him three months to you know break a first draft. They're going to have notes. Another two months to finally get it rocked down solid. Then they got to do location scouting. It's going to be a big movie. So I think take their time until they feel confident to like, all right, we're staking down this amount of, you know, they'll put, they'll, they'll have a release date probably by the end of the year is my guess, if not early next year. So yeah, I, I buy it. All right. What's next? According to Variety, Australian state and federal organizations will provide finance for Winchester, a supernatural thriller to be directed by filmmaking brothers Peter and Michael Spierig. Production will start in Melbourne, Australia in early 2017, with Helen Mirren in the role of Sarah Winchester, a millionaire heiress to the Winchester Arms Fortune, who designed and built the renowned Winchester Mystery House. A release date has yet to be set. Mark Byersell, a Winchester movie starring Helen Mirren. Uh, sure. I mean, why not? <laughs> Helen Mirren's in it. Like, if you guys have never heard of the Winchester House, the Winchester Mystery House is a place that I went to. I went to uh, Kirk Hammett had his Fear Fest there. I saw a murder mystery at Winchester House. Mm. Now, the murder mystery itself, part of it was like the local San Jose players, and it was not that. They were like mm. literally reading the script off their iPhone. <laughs> but being at the Winchester House was intriguing in one aspect, so I think you can make a good movie out of it. The actual lore behind the Winchester Mystery House, I feel like nothing in that place is actually haunted. I feel like it's just some crazy person just kept building houses on things. So it's a neat house from that perspective. But if you want to take some of that lore and spin it into a scary franchise or have Helen Mirren be in the front of it and play somebody important to the Winchester Mystery House, I think I'd be on board for a movie like that. Schnapp. I mean, I would like to see it just with no supernatural elements at all. Just the crazy, crazy town world of like, build another doorway to right. nothing. I mean, that, <laughs> I mean, the Winchester House, the lore of that is just fun just in its own right without any spooky elements. You could have Helen Mirren like playing a, you know, crackpot, you know, I need another doorway, you know, like just get her the doorway. <laughs> Winchester's, you know, I think it's it's it sounds good to me. And we do have drunk sidebar just in case you were. It worried. wasn't the sidebar. Yeah, it was sidebar. drunk. I'm drunk apparently. Drunk, yeah. <laughs> because I just yeah. get the story. Okay, so, sorry, so, sidebar. Sorry, sidebar. You drink right, a little too, time, little, too many fault. polygamies, right? <laughs> Devastators, right? Come on, you toss Salt Lake City baby. <laughs> All right, but before we get into what is now our final buy or sell thing, I want to li sorry. let you guys know that we are going to save a little bit of time at the end of the show to take your live Twitter questions. So if you have a question for us, you'd like to get on Twitter, simply tweet out to us right now at Collider Video and Wendy will be collecting those questions to ask at the end of the show. But for now, what is now our <laughs> final <laughs> buy or sell of this you, you, right. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 writer-director James Gunn gave Vin Diesel a first look at the anticipated sequel this past weekend with the actor jumping on Facebook live to share his reaction. Gunn also revealed that the script is a special version that only Vin Diesel has where every Groot line is printed in English instead of Groot, so Vin will know what the various I am Groots mean. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 is scheduled to hit theaters on May 5th, 2017. Schnett Byers sell a Groot-only version of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 script for Vin Diesel. Absolutely love that there is a Groot <laughs> script, that there's only two of them. Gunn has one and Diesel has the other. Everyone else is like, it just says, I am Groot. I know this is a secret script. It's just between him and Diesel so that Diesel can have those proper intonations to like, I am Groot. I am Groot, you know, whatever, <laughs> however he's going to read into it. I think it's great. I want, I think they should sell those because I want to actually own a Groot only script. That would be amazing. I want one show where you just totally say, I am Schnepp as your answer to everything. <laughs> and I want to hear you try to put your answer into the inflections in your voice. All right. That would be awesome. We're going to do that next week. <laughs> Mark, uh, I buy this, and I would love for James Gunn to translate all pets, all animals, all things <laughs> that only have one line. I want to know what what our dog Molly is saying when she's just barking and looking cute. Totally. I want to know more about what Groot is saying. This is so cool. This script has to come out eventually in some sort of like special bonus collectors that mm. I will not have the amount of money necessary to purchase it. But it sounds like a lot of fun. I want to check this thing out. You know, I absolutely love Snatch. It's like such it's such a great movie and hearing something like this what? <laughs> All he said is that he loves Snatch, yeah. and occasionally it's a it's the a shocker. That wasn't that needed he time. Likes Snatch that I heard much. laughs from over there. Yeah. Okay, that Anything wasn't needed to instigate. time. 
<laughs> the Brad Pitt movie. This reminds me a lot of that because the statue, they, you know, they're, they're pikeys, right? And they're always talking to pikey. Mm -hmm, right. There's a special Blu-ray edition of it where they do the subtitles for the pikeys ah, with different nice. with different renditions of it. It reminds me that I would love to see this, and I would love it if on the Blu-ray feature they actually put in subtitles for Groot, but then put in alternate subtitles for Groot at the same time. I just think That'd that would great. be a lot. I buy this. You're absolutely right, Schneff. Like when you're giving it to Vin Diesel. He does actually do a really good job in that first ones of you can kind of tell what he's saying through the inflections in his voice and giving him that actual dialogue I think is cool. Although it's probably not necessary since in the original Guardians of the Galaxy he says I am Groot and then you've got Rocket basically telling what he just said. What do you mean that was too unkind right. to say? You know, so it basically gives away anyway, but still it's kind of a cool idea. It's like R2D2 and C3PO. Yes. That's a, the, the back and forth with boot boot. No, I wouldn't do that. You know, so you sort of get that back and forth. And just from a fundamental s a filmmaking standpoint, it really helps out the actor to know exactly totally. what your emotion is going to be as opposed to just describing it to you every scene. It's like, here, just make this happen. Yeah, totally. All right, now, before we get on to our mailbag segment, I want to remind you guys that right here on Collider Video, not only do we have movie talk here every single day, but we got a couple of other great shows coming up a little bit later today. We got your weekly show, Nightmares, with my man John Schnepp over Whee! here. It's going to be airing at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's when it goes online. Keep your eyes open for that. And also TV Talk will be coming on at 6 p.m. a little bit later today. So keep your eyes open for those shows a little bit later. Well, for now, let's go to our mailbag segment. Ashley, what are people emailing in today? Alessandro Del Toral writes, which AFI prestige film top 100, which are a part of the National Film Registry, would you advise someone to watch who wants to get a gist of the beauty of film's history? Oh, it's a great question. You know what? If if you're a fan, I get, I get a lot of fans. I'm sure both of you guys do too. Like people who write, hey, if I really want to get into more movies, what are some movies I should really be getting into and watching? Just look up the AFI Top 100 list. Now, I'm not saying it's the most accurate of lists, mm. but if you want a can't go wrong uh, journey, I've got a couple of friends who have done the, this year I'm watching all 100 films on the AFI list. If you want a great movie journey, go through the AFI Top 100. To me, the movie that really stands out to me about what really reflects the beauty of film's history is To Kill a Mockingbird. Because not only is it a brilliant story, wonderfully directed, wonderfully acted, so far ahead of its time, to me it's, it's one of those films that remind us that films can also be very socially important. Because To Kill a Mockingbird was addressing issues at that time that were still considered extremely taboo. Like you could make To Kill a Mockingbird today and people would think it is relevant. But they did it in a time where it was so questionable. Like, how can you be telling stories about this? How can you talk about this issue head on? And they do it in a totally brave way. That film, when you understand the cultural context in which this movie was made, the courage it took to make that movie and the conviction in which they made it, makes me not only sit back and go, what an amazing movie, but it reminds me about the important role in our society that films can play at the same time and how they can help shape and change the direction of our culture. If you have not seen To Kill a Mockingbird, please, by all means, do it today. Find a way to watch it online. It's available out there. Watch To Kill a Mockingbird. So for me, it's To Kill a Mockingbird. Mark, what about you? Well, it's interesting because the AFI 100 list came out a few years ago, I think, at least yeah. 10 years ago. And there's a movie that wasn't made yet that I think really reflects the beauty of the history of film, and that would be Hugo, directed by Martin Scorsese. Mm. Since I can't pick that, one I'm gonna look at the top 100 and yet you're gonna think that I'm gonna pick something like Jaws or something like Star Wars or Wizard of Oz and those are great movies that reflect the awesomeness that film can bring but I'm gonna go really off book here I'm gonna go so rogue it's gonna surprise a lot of uh -oh. people Singing in the Rain, oh, I think, yeah. is the perfect representation of how beautiful film can be if you go all the way to the beginning of cinema when it was just talkies on a screen and then moving to something like those beautiful shots of seeing Gene Kelly dancing in the rain, oh. him and Debbie Reynolds. They're so great on screen and it transports you to an entirely different dimension, not mm -hmm. just a different place in time, but this dimension where all of these things can happen in real life and you believe every frame of it. It is one of the most gorgeous movies you will ever see. I highly recommend checking out Singing in the Rain. I'm, so glad, you. I'm glad you picked Singing in the Rain. I picked a couple different films, but I was starting with Singing in the Rain, also Sunset Boulevard, because mm -hmm. both oh, of those yeah. films show you the world of filmmaking in front of the camera and, and behind. behind it. Yeah. So Singing in the Rain is a really incredible, enjoyable, fun 
film and I like yeah if you've never seen it you got to do yourself the pleasure of seeing that film Sunset Boulevard the dark uglier side of Hollywood the the lost stars the people who can't get the, you don't get the attention anymore they're trying to get their careers back you know really, I should throw this in there I know you were there too at the John Williams concert mm. this weekend they did an entire five minute musical montage with clips on the screen of Sunset Boulevard right. and yeah. it was wow. awesome I'm so glad you picked that, that that's a and then I of course I, I threw in Raiders the Lost Ark, Star Wars 2001, Apocalypse Now, Fantasia, Easy Rider, Goodfellas, as movies showing that they can be transformative, take you to other realities, and you kind of time travel within not just our regular world, mm. but also other realities. So I think those films are really great. They're in the AFI. You've got uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Chinatown, The Deer Hunter, Platoon, Taxi Driver, and Unforgiven. That gives you the emotional power and the pathos of the human condition. I think all of these films, I mean, it's the list, like you said, 100 films, all of them are top tier, the most incredible films. For me, my favorite, you know, a lot of people always use Citizen Kane. The like, oh, I heard Citizen Kane. I, I, that's in my, one, it's in my top 10 films of all time because it shows you the genius of original storytelling. Mm mixed with incredible acting and incredible direction. That film kind of is un, still unbeaten in my mind as far as like, what an incredible story. So I would go with Citizen Kane. Probably, yes, it's in black and white. Just give it a chance. <laughs> Rose spot. That's All right. right, guys, now I've told you guys we would save a little bit of time. Take your questions live via Twitter and we'll do that right now. You might even ask time still to squeeze in a couple, fire them off to at Collider Video. Wendy is actually our gatekeeper on that today, so make sure you kiss up to her a little bit. So Wendy, what are people asking in Twitter. Dunk7309 says, with summer officially over, what films are you guys looking forward to for the rest of 2016? Oh, gosh. Ooh. You know what? I wasn't until just the trailer dropped the other week, The Arrival. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I mean, look, there's a lot of great movies still to come. We're actually getting into that Oscar bait season where so many great heavyweight movies come. But I was not looking forward to The Arrival. It looked like such a pedestrian kind of come and go movie to me. And then that trailer hit. And I got to tell you, I'm super stoked for that one. What about you? Here's the thing about Jack Reacher, right? Is that those guys <laughs> will go back occasionally. This guy never once has gone back. I'm going to say The Accountant with Ben Affleck. I'm going to say Girl on the Train. Obviously, Rogue One is the one that I'm most excited about. It's that little Star Wars flick coming out. <laughs> and Passengers is something that is just so mm, mysterious yeah. to me. I still want to know more about it. I want to see some footage from it. I want to see the trailer. But until that happens, and John, you're right on with the arrival. I want to see nothing more from that film until mm. I actually get to witness it. And Blair Witch is one that's coming out. I hope I get to see it next week. Mm. That is going to be awesome. And I hope it's not on the screening isn't on Monday night because there's a big game. Now, Schnepp, night. I'm suspecting there might be a certain medical practitioner on your yeah. list. Someone with, with hands that had to be fixed by magic. Yeah, Doctor Strange is the number one film on my list. And actually, it's it's not The Arrival, it's Arrival. The Arrival is the one with Charlie Sheen. Oh, yes. Yeah, I think the, I said The Arrival. You guys I think I, the I arrival, messed up. But yeah. It's, yeah, it's that also, Which, by the way, if you want to see Aliens with the Reversible Knees, go see Charlie Sheen's masterpiece, yeah. The Arrival. And that's, it is a, a, that's a top 100 AFI movie I forgot it, to mention. It should be at least in the top 100 sci-fi films. It's a fun film. Yeah. Uh, you know, look, it's a really good film. I'm not, I'm not cracking on it. I love The Arrival. And they're creepy weird aliens with reversible <laughs> knees and that's not a spoiler it really happens in literally the first 10 minutes anyway arrival yes i'm excited about that doctor strange is the top one on my list passenger is a close third so all right what's next well since a couple of you got to see john williams in concert this past weekend the lone wolf 68 wants to know out of all of the john williams film scores which ones do you think is his most underrated oh good oh. question it's different Mm. His most underrated. You know what? Only be nobody talks about it. The, the Jurassic Park score, like to me, is just stunning. And like it, it just it whisks me when a score can play, and I'm instantly mentally just taken then back into the movie. Like I can listen to Star Wars, which greatest themes of all time, obviously. But I can listen to Star Wars and just listen to the Star Wars music, right? It doesn't necessarily transport me back to the movie per se. I can hear the Imperial March. It doesn't necessarily transport me back to the movie. When I hear Jurassic Park, it it takes me back to what's it called? Uh, Isle Nubla Nublar mm -hmm. or whatever it is. It takes me Island back Nebula. there. So that's the one for me. Schnapp, what would you say? I'm just scrolling through. I, I I don't see a lot that would be underrated. underrated. <laughs> sort of like uh, Jaws. There's too many that are good. So, um, yeah. 
I don't see any right off the bat. Like I'm just looking at his uh, IMDb. Well, it was funny because like like leaving John Williams concert, I felt like a spoiled rich kid who like didn't get to ride the one ride at Disneyland, that, and that's what I'm bitching about because he didn't play Jurassic Park. He also didn't play Indiana Jones and or Jaws. And it's like you're yeah. walking, you're like, oh, they, but we also got like a lot of kick-ass Star Wars tunes. Yeah. We got the Superman theme, which is one of my all-time favorites. Seeing yes. him play it live, it, like Iron Maiden may as well have been on stage. It's that powerful. And then he did an encore with E.T. E.T. is an underrated one because I never love the score watching the movie but seeing him play it live i was like this is really uh giving me some emotional feels right oh, now actually one of the, one of the pieces they did play that a lot of people didn't recognize it if you want to talk about underrated ones his score for pan because maybe he, he played the uh the score for pan when they have the food fight and they're flying over the ocean and stuff like that oh for hook, hook. yeah for, sorry did i say pan i'm oh, sorry jesus hook. god totally different yeah. movie different film hook <laughs> sorry <laughs> he did hook and then, and then uh, they also did bfg which uh, w yes. which was a good score. And then Tin Tin, I think, is the most underrated one because people just don't talk oh, yeah, about that movie, one. Tin Tin. When you listen to the John Williams score of Tin Tin, it feels like you're back in an Indiana Jones-style universe. So check the movie out. It's really good, and I think the score is fantastic. All right, let's take another one. All right, Pizza Savage 9000 says, Hey, Collider, simply <laughs> a debatable question. Do you think Spider-Man Homecoming is starting off with too many villains? You know, this is a question, and it's an understandable question that comes up now and again, because when you look at The Last Amazing Spider-Man, you would be tempted to say, the problem with The Last The Amazing Spider-Man was they packed in too many villains. But I would suggest, you know, whether you're looking at, you know, X-Men, Days of Future Past, you're looking whatever, you can have 15 villains. And you hear Schnepp and I say this all the time, especially about comic book movies. It's not the number of villains, it's how are you using the villains you have. Because you can go into some stories that have seven villains and it's like, perfect. Some villains will have, some movies will have three villains and it's like, that felt way too crowded. It all depends on how they're used. Anyway, Schnepp, how would you answer that? Yeah, first I would say the Iger sanction for the John Williams one. That's like the oh, underrated, right, right. like you probably said, Clint mm. Eastwood film, check it out. Um, yeah, I mean, that you, you nailed it. It's like, it's, it's how it's actually, how is the film written and how do they introduce all of the characters, not just the main characters, but also the villains. I mean, you always have those, like, it always seems like the second film has like, no, we gotta have more than one. The first film had one villain, now you gotta have two villains in the second film. That seems to be the case with almost every superhero film. Mm. And whether it's Batman Returns, you had, you know, Penguin and Catwoman. Every single film kind of plussed it up with two or three villains. And there's nothing wrong with that. It kind of works in every film, except for some of the more recent ones. Like you saw The Amazing Spider-Man 2, and it didn't work because they were trying to introduce way too many things, but without the actual storytelling that's important and necessary to make it work. So instead, right. it felt like, oh, why are you cramming all this stuff in? Because it wasn't done fluidly, as in that they made you feel like it would be fluid when you saw the trailers, but instead it wasn't fluid. So it's important to like have the actual story from Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, especially when you're not doing a television series where you have a lot of time to introduce all these different characters and story arcs to make it very clean from the very beginning all the way to the very end so it doesn't feel like you're like, why is this guy getting wedged in here? I think it is a concern because it's Spider-Man Homecoming and it's the first time we get to see this Spider-Man in his first feature-length film. Now look, we got the taste of him in Civil War and it was really neat to see that, but I want to see this focus, even if it's not necessarily a straight origin story, which we've seen done to death with Spider-Man, but I want to get to know him before I get to know what else this universe has to offer us. So I do think it's a valid concern. I'm not worried about it because I trust particularly Marvel being producing partners with Sony. Right. I trust that, that the, 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 the team involved in this this film enough to not be like, oh wait, are we gonna be Amazing Spider-Man 2 or too many villains? There's a way to do it properly, but I'd save the bulk of the villains for future Spider-Man films. All right, last question of the day. All right, Tom P. 115 says, Ashley rules. Is there any chance that you'll start doing 30 and or 40 years old movies on your rewind segments? That's a great question. You know, it's, it's something that people have brought up with us ever since we started doing mm -hmm. Rewind, because like, for those of you who don't know, we do Rewind on Wednesdays, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. We do Rewind on Wednesdays and we look at the movies that are turning 10 years old and 20 years old. And very fairly, a lot of people have always asked us, why not do 30 years old? Why not 40? Why not 50? That's a really good question. The answer is just kind of because the segment is only so long and then where do we stop? Like, right. do we do then 60 years old? How about, how about not just 20, what about 25? Or, right. And then we even asked the question once, what if we just talk about movies celebrating, significant movies celebrating anniversaries that week? 
we could do that, but then next year, one year from today, we're just talking about the same movies again. So that's kind of why. But Schnepp, do you think we're good staying with 10 or 20? Have you thought about maybe doing 30 or 40? Yeah, no, I think the 10 and 20 works. I mean, we had a show back at the AMC days called Rewind. Not enough of you punks watched it, so we had to cancel it. So there, that's why you don't get 30 years because of you. But if we don't want to blame you and we want to actually move into like celebrating 30 or 40 years, I think we'd have to do it, like you said, it would have to be a very special film. Like this is the release of, you know, the 78 eighth you know anniversary of wizard of oz or mm, like yeah. films that would be in the afi top 100 you'd have to make it very special because look at like you know some of these lists you're like i don't remember that film from 10 years ago or 20 years ago you get these releases that were just clunkers but we're doing like hey these films came out 10 years ago these films came out 20 years ago if we keep going back in time you're right we don't have enough time to cover it unless we made it a full show and if we did cover it, it should be for special events these Mark? are great problems to have, though. Yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah, how many movies do we get to, to celebrate right. in one episode of Movie Talk? 1986, though, was a pretty great year. <laughs> when you look on it with the glasses, the rose-tinted glasses that we have, because week to week, I have no idea what kind of crap they were throwing at us in the box office. But when you look back on the greats in 1986, this year we could have talked about Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Top Gun, which I think we did talk about because mm. I forced it into mm. the show that day. And then you got your <laughs> Cobra, you got your Aliens, you got Crocodile Dundee. There's a lot of fun movies to talk about in 86 but I'd rather focus on the more immediate history and then occasionally celebrate a 30th or 40th anniversary when the time warrants it as opposed to doing it in the show every week. Definitely. You know, yeah, that might be a good point. Like, maybe we should look at, like, okay, we'll do 10 and 20, but maybe if there's something really significant that happened on the 30th or the 40th, we should throw that in as a mention. Maybe it's something we could look With at. With the asterisk that it's no more work for any of us. That's Mark <laughs> Riley's job. More work on his desk is always a good day at my office. Or we could do an end of the year, like, something called decades or something where we, like, just pick, like, the top five from each decade. I don't know. That's a lot of work, too. That's <laughs> a good you have to watch these shows. Uh, well, guys, that will do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. I think a little bit later today we might even be recording a little new DVD commentary. Whee! I believe we are. Keep your eyes open for that. I want to thank you guys so much for joining us, but I also want to thank the people sitting at the table with, with me. First of all, sitting on my left, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. And later today with Clark Wolf, you will experience Collider Nightmares. Always love doing that. And then, of course, tomorrow is Collider Heroes. You can catch me there. And don't forget, just after Nightmares Ages today, also the newest edition of TV Talk will be on later today as well. Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you? For more Jack Reacher tweets, you can follow me on Twitter <laughs> at Mark Ellis Live. This Friday is going to be a huge day for me. I'm announcing my New York City date, which is very special. Comic-Con, get excited. But also on Friday, me versus Sam Levine mm. in the Ultimate Schmodown Tournament. Little Baby Carrots is going up against a savant known as Sam Levine yeah. from Freaks and Geeks, from Inglorious Bastards. He is the Inglorious One. I like my chance. Is tweet both me and Sam. Let us know who do you think is going to win that matchup. I'm starting to sweat just a little bit. At the end of the table, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you? Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, at Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. Sitting back there doing our Twitter board for us is Miss Wendy Lee. Wendy, where can people find you? On Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat, at Wendy Lee Zaney. You can follow me on Facebook and Twitter at Mr. Shocker. No, sorry, that's at John Campia. You can follow me there. Guys, make sure you subscribe to Collider Video. Stay up to date on everything we're doing on going on over here. Not just our daily movie talk, Nightmares, Heroes, Jedi Council, Top 10, TV Talk. So much good stuff going on. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. I want to thank everybody else in the room as well and thank you guys. Remember, the most important part of this show is not what we have to say, it's what you have to say. Jump into the comments section and leave us your thoughts on any or all the topics that we discuss here today. That'll do it for us guys. Thanks so much for joining us and until next time, bye bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.